Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, our use of minerals has gone hand in hand with human development. As we embrace a low carbon future, we may be at the brink of a new mineral age. We talked to Ben Jones from CRU Group to understand the implications. The extractives industry's early response to this low carbon future was one of panic almost, but the narrative is changing and the industry is embracing this more and more. But how big of a change are we really facing? Well, I'm not sure uh, the extractive industry is exactly panicked in the face of low carbon transition. In fact, arguably, you could, you could say that they haven't moved far and fast enough. But certainly, I think the discussion started with a focus on energy products. And since then, it has moved towards uh, an analysis of the impacts for metal markets. Um, and, and with that shift has brought uh, a change in tone from one of risk to one of opportunity. Why does a low carbon future matter to the extractives industry? Well, demand for raw materials is closely related to lo long term structural changes in the wider global economy. And uh, low carbon transition is arguably one of the major megatrends we anticipate during the 21st century. So put simply, many low carbon technologies such as renewable power or electric vehicles, for example, use uh, metals more intensively than conventional alternatives. But when we're looking at this future forecasting, there are so many uncertain elements. We don't know where technology is heading, changing regulatory and political environment, etc. How do you go about forecasting the demand and supply of, of minerals? Sure, it's a really tricky area. Um, it's long term, it's uncertain, and it's exposed to lots of different questions, as you say, around policy and technology and the like. So any commodity market researcher worth their salt wouldn't claim to be able to know the future. I think more the purposes of long term demand forecasting, for example, is to create frameworks for thinking intelligently about, about what the future might look like and what it might mean for some of the key industry players, for example. These assumptions that you put into your models, how do you select them? So I guess on the technical side, uh, there are broadly speaking three steps. So the first step would probably be to elicit all the potential drivers of demand, and that could be in relation to policy, it could be in relation to the future technological environment, or indeed the future of economic development in different countries or the other around the world. So having done that, I think the next step would be to consider plausible futures around each of those drivers. And that's inevitably a rather subjective, uh, subjective exercise in some sense. But, you know, if you were to think about policy, for example, you would look at, say, the carbon constraints and the carbon commitments that have been made by governments around the world. And you can start to think credibly around whether they have uh, policies to actually implement those objectives. And in so doing, you can come to, say, a set of assumptions around what the future might look like for, say, uh, supportive carbon policies, renewable subsidies and the like. So having thought through the drivers and thought through how they might evolve over time, one starts the quantitative business of thinking about how they evaluate and so how the various overlapping forces bear on the future demand for, for metals. So that's usually involved um, thinking about the available data and trying to explore what those data tell you for the way in which you, you structure and calibrate your model. Let's move into minerals demand, fossil fuels, oil, coal, will they be phased out completely? So the conventional wisdom with uh, fossil fuels is that demand growth will slow and ultimately reverse. So the timing of that peak demand and the extent to which demand will be eroded um, are subject to debate. In the case of oil, for example, uh, the conventional wisdom could be that oil might peak in demand terms between, say, 2025 and 2035, perhaps. Um, in the case of coal, uh, the view is probably that we're a little bit closer to peak demand, uh, perhaps 2020 or even 2025. So thinking about the extent to which demand will be eroded in the long term, the bad news is, from an environmental perspective, is that demand for fossil fuels is derived from the stock of capital and investment goods that use those fuels. And very often those capital uh, goods are long lived which means that the extent to which demand will fall depends on how quickly we can essentially stop using some of these technologies. A coal-fired power station invested in today will still likely 
be in use in 25 or 30 years time unless we take collective action against that. Um, and also you have to bear in mind that, that there will probably be significant limits to the substitution of the use of these fuels in certain segments. So one classic example could be around uh, aviation and the use of, use of oil for flying, which I think is going to be quite difficult to do with solar or battery power. The energy transition means more electricity, and more electricity means more cables. Will it be all eyes on copper? I think so. Certainly a low carbon world means an electrified world, and copper is one of our most effective conductive materials. Um, so it's entirely plausible that as we electrify uh, to reduce the use of fossil fuels in, say, heat, for example, that we will use more and more copper. The issue is that the demand for copper is quite diversified. Um, so the specific applications we're talking about are only a small component of the overall demand picture. So it means that the uh, demand for copper will be strong, but not transformative. So for example, our analysis suggests that demand could increase by three, four, even five million tonnes in 10 or 12 years time in a reasonably green world relative to a baseline. But in terms of the overall market, that represents a, an increase in demand of between, say, 10, 15, 20 percent. So it's significant, but it's not transformative. But there are other materials that could be a competitor to, to copper when it comes to conductors, aren't there? Absolutely. So copper is always subject to pressure from aluminium in many end use segments that require uh, its conductivity pro properties. So in, for example, high voltage transmission, we typically use aluminium rather than copper. Um, and certainly those tensions and those, that competition will continue. And if copper prices rise, as we believe they will be, because the costs of supplying those materials are increasing, we think that that competition will be sustained. Now, in the very longer term, it's possible to imagine uh, new potentially mm. higher cost, higher performing conductive materials, and um, it'll be interesting to see how they develop. In terms of power storage and batteries, is the lithium revolution overstated? Well, I guess it depends on who you listen to. There are a lot of numbers being bandied around and not all of them are that uh, as well thought out as, as they perhaps might be. I mean, it's a very exciting time, I think. We've been talking about uh, potential innovations in batteries and in chemical storage for a long time. And I think we're finally at the stage where things are starting to take off. Uh, so we see the unit costs of cell manufacture really coming down in a way that we perhaps saw in, in solar photo photovoltaics some years ago. So that's great news. And our, our analysis suggests that actually now the cost of owning and operating an electric vehicle, for example, is close to parity with a conventional alternative. So we have every reason to believe that the economics speaks to us as consumers driving electric vehicles more and more in the years to come. And that will mean batteries. Um, moreover, these new uh, end uses, this new storage demand is really, really important for some of these minor markets. So lithium or cobalt, for example, are very small markets relative to copper, just one or 200,000 tonnes globally a year. Um, so the importance of these segments is very high. They already comprise 30, 40, even 50 percent of the total demand. So in a world where we think demand for lithium into batteries or cobalt into batteries could increase 25, 30 percent a year in the, in the years ahead, clearly we're going to have uh, big changes in those markets ahead. So you mentioned electric cars and in terms of transport, electric vehicles and electric engines need lighter vehicles. When the future goes lighter, will aluminium be king? I think so. Um, so we're already seeing higher demands for fuel performance around the world, uh, causing cars to become lighter. And lighter cars right now means more, s more aluminium and less steel. So for example, the automotive sector accounts for around 35 or 40 percent of total aluminium demand globally, and we think that could rise to, to 40 to 50 or 60 percent in say 10 or 15 years time. And so as a proportion of growth, that really is very significant. So what does the rise of aluminium mean for iron ore? Our view is not a great deal if you're thinking purely in terms of uh, changes in transportation. And that's by and large because um, it does, it's not very important relative to, say, the construction sector for the overall picture of the industry. Let's move into supply. 
Are companies ready? Are they ready for this shift in minerals? I think we're at an inflection point. So looking backwards, uh, prices have been down since around, around 2011, and that's had a big negative impact on investment. So we're now at the stage where prices have, have been at a higher level, and companies are beginning to think about planning for growth. And the industry is inherently optimistic and forward-looking, so we have every confidence that the um, that the industry is in a position to start moving forward and building growth plans and expanding their production. What are some of the technical challenges for the companies? I think the challenges uh, range from policy, technical and economic. Um, so if you're to think about you know, what is a cocktail of success factors for mm. a company, I think having a clear view on the, on the market and how to position themselves strategically in that future market is a really important starting point and certainly advisory work around low carbon minerals and what it means for future demand, I think is an increasingly important part of that overall picture. But then it's the usual components of strong balance sheets, uh, excellent pro project execution and the like. Um, and if you put it all together, I think it, it, it will stand many companies in good stead for the future. Do you see that this low carbon future will mean a significant geographical shift in terms of uh, production? how would the production map look like in 2030? I think the picture is, is one of continuity and change. Uh, so if you consider the world of copper, for example, I think it's plausible to expect in a world where uh, there are impending supply gaps in five, six, seven years time, that all the major producers, be it China, be it Chile, be it Peru, be it Kazakhstan, Mongolia, you name them, they will all need to come to the play in order to produce um, more copper. Um, so whether there will be a significant shift in the regional composition is an open question. We actually think that China, for example, will become an increasingly important supplier. In other cases, the picture could be more dynamic. So in lithium, for example, it's really uh, an industry that is just being birthed now. So there, for example, it's conceivable that the locus of production could shift first to Australia and then perhaps afterwards to the lithium triangle in, Sa in, in South America, or to Chile, to Argentina and to Bolivia. You mentioned that the future of lithium is very uncertain. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that is going to play an important role in the low carbon future. How should countries think um, looking at um, start producing something like lithium? I think it's a really tough area. Um, so I think we can say with some confidence that the next 10 or 12 or 15 years, say, will be very positive for lithium. So if you are a producer of low cost, hard rock um, lithium, then you should be in a good position to uh, benefit from those resources. Um, now, in the longer term, there are probably opportunities for chemists, chemical engineers to substitute lithium, which is the binding agent in the cathode of many of these uh, batteries, to be substituted to other materials. And in that context, uh, there are certainly long-term risks. But for the time being, I think lith lithium, especially low-cost producers of lithium, are in a reasonably good position. So with this shifting production, what do you see the geopolitical impact being? Uh, who are the winners and the losers? Well, I think the impact depends on the market in question. So if we consider, for example, cobalt, where, where supply is very heavily centred in the DRC or in, in Zambia, um, and there are relatively limited potentials to substitute away from some of these materials, potentially the tensions around access to resources and the price at which they are purchased could be very real indeed. And we see, for example, automakers around the world already uh, in talks with the uh, miners and some of the suppliers of these key raw materials for longer term contracts to try and manage some of these risks. So there's certainly potential for tension and there's potential for real resource rents. Now, how these are allocated is, is anyone's guess, but unfortunately I think history tells that Oftentimes it's the major buyers with market power that are able to uh, um, enjoy some of these rents. Now, um, thinking about lithium, for example, um, it's somewhat different. Um, it's a much less scarce resource and it's distributed much more uh, diffusely around the world, including in both developed and uh, developing markets. So in that sense, I think the pressure for rents, uh, the pressure for uh, appropriating resources and ensuring their control 
are somewhat lower. Ben, thank you very much for taking us through these future developments. It's my pleasure. And to keep up with the new debate on extractives and development, join us at vortox.org.